Hey folks, Kiltman here, Count Kiltman, at your New Year's service. Because yes, we have now kicked off the shackles of 2019 and now we're speeding along with gusto into 2020, the beginning of a whole new decade. And things, as the song says, can only get better. Well, let's hope so. They can't get any fucking worse, can they? But no, I'm not talking politics. I'm not talking climate change. Tonight, we're going to talk blood. Before the blood is the life. And what's been aired on UK TV, on the Beeb, on the BBC, uh, is the first of a three-part mini-series, a new adaptation of Dracula. Yes, written by uh, Mark Gattis and Stephen Moffat. They've worked together many times before. And they always put like a bit of a a quirky slant on things, shall we say. And this Dracula is no exception. I forgot the name of the guy who plays Dracula in this. In fact, I've forgotten all the cast people's names. I don't remember them, but did a good job. Now, folks, it's a three-parter. Tonight, tomorrow, and the next night. Three consecutive nights, each episode running for 90 minutes. 90 gore-soaked minutes. Whoa, that's epic. That's brilliant, you know. Um, by the way, I'm playing Hammer's uh, Dracula, the original 1958 Dracula, because I have not got the soundtrack to this new Dracula, which, by the way, is done by David Arnold. You know, so it's actually pretty good, but it's not available as yet. But mark my words, I will get it before long. Um, now, if you haven't seen it, I would urge you to go and watch it. It's going to be on Netflix. It's a BBC Netflix co-production, so. It's on the next two nights uh, on, on the Beeb in episode format. And then on Sunday, the 4th of January, I think that's the day anyway, it's got the whole thing in one blood-soaked bundle will be on Netflix for you to sink your teeth into. And, uh, and I recommend you do so because on the basis of this first episode, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Now, folks, if you haven't seen it, rush off and do so. Uh, but don't watch the rest of my video until you have. Or if you've got no interest in it at all, stay with me and we'll have some fun anyway. And get yourself a tipple, because we're going to be here for some time. I don't drink. Fine. I drink. Fisky. <laughs> mm, 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 mm. Fairly good vintage as well. Now, anyone expecting a faithful adaptation of Bram Stoker's classic vampire novel, you better look elsewhere. Some would say there's never been a really faithful adaptation of it, and to be honest, there hasn't really. Dan Curtis did a great Dracula version um, in the 70s as a TV movie with Jack Palance playing Dracula. And if I remember rightly, he had a tash in that. The Beeb did um, a great one with Louis Jordan back in the 70s as well, which is quite experimental with its sound design and its visual effects. And that was brilliant. That's a brilliant, brilliant show. I definitely recommend that one. But really, there hasn't been one that's really followed the novel. Loads have tried. Francis Ford Coppola. Coppola's Bram Stoker's Dracula with Gary Oldman playing the Count made a very conscious effort to try to be like the book but it, it, it you know it, it wasn't in some you know vital areas but we're not here to talk about those this version is fucking nowhere near faithful so anyone who thought it was going to be I don't know where you got the idea from um, I've got a, a lot of people are, on forums and been going, this one's going to be faithful adaptation. It's going to tell the story exactly as it is in the book. Bullshit, boy. Bullshit. For a start, you've got no Renfield. Well, you certainly haven't got him as yet. He may still make an appearance. I don't know. But Jonathan Harker, played by... <laughs> goes over to Transylvania to get the Count, the reclusive aristocratic Count Dracula, who's very old and haggard, with long, wispy, spidery, you know, white hair... Yeah, to sign some documents for his purchase of Carfax Abbey, Carfax Abbey in the UK. Because the Count has grown sick and tired of the, the slim pickings in the, the, the neighbouring you know, mountains of Transylvania and Budapest and all this and Romania. And he wants to come to the, the population heavy British Isles where he can slaughter everybody. But he knows he's going to get a better vintage of blood because there's people of intelligentsia. People of cultural standing, you know, and that's what he wants. In the books, he never really, the books, the books from Budapest, 
In the book, you never find out really why the Count wants to do this. It's just a means to an end. And uh, But in this, you do find out the, the, the very reason he wants to go over there, which I'll come on to. So, Harker goes to the ca Castle Dracula, encounters, encounters the Count, and gradually begins to suffer weakness and frailty. And the whole world seems to change around him because nightly he's been getting drained of blood. But he wanders the castle throughout the daytime. He finds caskets full of air and photographs of people that he thinks, well, are they in there? And yes, indeed they are. Because you've now got not just the, the brides of Dracula, because pretty much anybody the Count puts the bite on and leaves in the castle comes back, male, female, even a baby. A, ba a baby vampire, yes, because the Count is experimenting. He wants to see if he can reproduce, but he's doing all these wacky sort of experiments to try to bring back other levels of undeadness. So, and he knows, you know, the format that the stages people go through when they become victims to his bite. But he's encountered no one so far that survived and kept their humanity, their intelligence, like he has until he meets Jonathan Harker, who somehow manages to do so. Um, but the Count obviously gets younger as the uh, the blood goes into his... It begins to absorb the essences of Jonathan Harker. So he goes through a stage where he looks astonishingly like James Mason, who, of course, was great in Salem's Lot as, you know, the Barlow vampire, the Nosferatu-type vampire has a human sort of um, familiar, a human muse to look after him during the day and to do his bidding, and that's James Mason. And he does go through a stage where I thought, Jesus Christ, they're, they're mimicking James Mason here. And weirdly as well, his voice changes because he has a really thick sort of, you know, Eastern European accent at the start when you meet Count Dracula. But the weird thing about that is he sounds like Borat. <laughs> Borat. Sasha Baron Cohen's, you know, um, Kazakhstan cultural fucking, you know, minister. <laughs> so, so I was laughing because of that. There's a lot of suspense in it. The location work, I'm not sure where they filmed this. I'm presuming they've gone to some Slovakian, you know, nation. There's loads of location. That, that castle is definitely a real thing. Probably with some CG embellishments. But I reckon that is a genuine castle. I went on IMDB to, to see where the filming locations were, and it didn't tell me. So, I'm on the wiser. But the castle looks amazing. The interiors are fabulous. Uh, you know, and it's got that sense of decadence, faded, you know, glory, and lots of nasty old secrets. Winding corridors, you know, spiral staircases, locked doors, you know, dungeons, and you know, rooms up in the attic and all this absolutely brilliant and it does feel like it's genuinely you know out there in you know Transyl Transylvania the Count's performance is uh, well it's written by Mark Gathis and Stephen Moffat so as I say they have a quirky sense of humour so does the Count there is rather a lot of humour uh, one-liners and you know zingers and uh, He's got quite a sarcastic, well, not, not even sarcastic, he's quite flippant and he takes the piss, does our count. And uh, that may not sit well with some people. And at the start of this, it's told in flashback for a good part of this um, episode because Jonathan Harker has escaped the castle and it's actually, you know, in the sanctuary of a nunnery. And the sisters are interviewing him. Now, during these moments of interrogation, and he looks a mess, and we find out why he looks such a, a bloody awful mess. Because he's dead! Oh, spoiler alert. The Count has actually killed him. He has no heartbeat. But we don't realise this. Well, you kind of fucking do guess it. He looks cadaverous. He's bald. He's got sores on his face. His eyes are sort of sickly. He's known as Johnny. Blue-eyed Johnny. And um, we'll come on to more of that in a bit. But the guy who plays him, it's it's a good performance. Uh, having to put up with like looking drained and emaciated for like most of the episode, and being really weak and feeble, you know, it's kind of you know, you're hardly the hero. And he's not going to be the hero that he is in the book either, 
or any of the film versions. He's definitely on a on a bum bum steer. Is our Jonathan? Anyway, Sister Abigail is interrogating him because he's he's written apparently before she got there when he turned up at this at this uh, nunnery, he wrote for seven days and seven nights non-stop his his account of how he got out of there and what happened we fell him and of course a bit like um in the shining where shelly duval finally gets to read what what jack's been writing you know a called wacko jack has been writing and it's all work and no play it makes jack a dull boy you know and yeah well what he's been writing is dracula is the lord dracula is my prince dracula is god over and over and over and over again throughout reams of paper like that so you're like oh shit so they're trying to get out of him what literally he's got to tell them what befell him and how he escaped uh, so it's all told in kind of flashback and uh he's a fucking mess but yeah the count is a very strange sort of uh variation once he gets younger and uh, and his english is impeccable by the way and he's got a bit of an accent a slight subdued Cockney accent is in there, and uh, he's <laughs> he is a funny character. I've got to be honest. It's not what you expect. Yes, he can be quite frightening, and he is violent. Yeah, uh, and you will have a Grah! lots of you know, blood red eyes, hissing, and fangs will grow. Uh, he will transform into a wolf, but we actually see him come out of the wolf phase by clawing his way out of the wolf's carcass to stand fully naked in front of the nunnery full of sisters who are armed with stakes these are like the elite of the, the nuns brigade these all know how to deal with vampires but in a clever little switch what you get with this episode is and look I told you if you don't want to know these things you know please tune out and come back later because I ain't holding back now um, sister Abigail is actually not Sister Abigail. She's Abigail Van Helsing. Yes, and she's making her life. I don't know if Van Helsing, you know, her uncle, you know, Professor Abraham Van Helsing, is going to be in it. I presume he will be, but I, I don't know. I don't know. And I haven't checked, you know, in the, the, the credits to see if you know, he's going to crop up or not. I presume he will do. He's got to. Um, but she is making her life uh, obsession with the undead and vampires because she wants to find her faith in God again. But she wants that proof that God exists. She's travelled the world, never found proof of it. But with Jonathan Harker, how the hell did he escape? And then the revelation that, you know, if you've, you've got no heartbeat, you're quite dead, you know? <laughs> and, you, and you didn't write anything apart from, Dracula is my lord, Dracula is the prince, he is God. You know, that's all you wrote. So I want to find out what's happening. Why does he not like the, the, the crucifix? Why does the sun... You know, turn him into ash. Why did he only come out at night? What is it in the blood? How is it he doesn't become, you know, a sort of zombie-like creature like most of the undead? He, re he retains, you know, his nobility, his arrogance, his intelligence, his dominant spirit. Why have they got to be invited in before they can actually penetrate the defences of, you know, a victim's home? She wants to work out all these things. Like, she knows all these things. And they do come up, like... These things are all true. The stake through the heart. It's all true. But why? Why does it happen? What? What is the cause? And I think that's the ace up the sleeve in this version. They're going to come up with a reason why this is. So they're gonna. They're attacking this. Every cliche is there. All the things we know and love about the vampire lore and mythology is there. But they're gonna come out with a reason why. Maybe it's scientific. Maybe it's just you know socio-religious mumbo jumbo. But it doesn't matter. They look, they're look. they attacking this from a different perspective. And it's funny. It's funny. It's frightening. And it works. Now, I'll be honest. In the first sort of half hour during the, the interview, the interrogation sequences, uh, Sister Abigail Van Helsing uh, has got a wicked, very modern sense of humour. And, you know, the, the word play is witty, the dialogue is sharp and acidic. It's clever, but it's also... This is the thing. It's been modernised. It's set back in, you know, Victorian times. It's set back when the novel story was set. So that, that is definitely there. 
and it looks like that time period as well. But the dialogue is very sort of snappy, sharp, modern. I mean, didn't Mark Gattis and Stephen Moffat write some Doctor Who episodes, or maybe a lot of Doctor Who episodes? And again, it's that sort of sense of humour, that sensibility runs through Dracula. Now, you might not be expecting that, and you might not like it. And at first, I thought, hmm, I'm really not sure if I'm digging this or not, because it, it seems they're having their cake and eating it as well. Do you want to be frightening? Do you want to be suspenseful? Do you want to be respectful? Or are you just sort of modernising this and taking the piss? Well, they've modernised it, and where I thought they were taking the piss, I now accept what they've done, because they have absolutely radically changed Dracula's character to a taunting, uh, tormenting aggressor, with a very sort of, you know, it's arrogant sense of humour. When he does finally uh, get into the nunnery, he's vowed he will tear the nuns apart and you know and he well he does so and <laughs> make no bones about this jonathan harker when um, mina gets a cut oh there you go another little spoiler for you sister abigail has another nun sitting beside her oh this is my chaperone because apparently they don't trust me with a man <laughs> well He's forgotten Mina's face as part of his, his undead dilemma. He is now, although he knows he loves his, his fiancée Mina back home, he, he cannot see her face anymore. Mina is the actual uh, other sister in disguise, and it's all part of this deception to try to lure what's happened to Jonathan Harker out of him. And then when she finally reveals who she is, and, you know, Mina, you know, he loves her. Uh, bats explode through the, the windows and one tears into her face like that so she'll get some blood and of course that blood will then arouse, aggravate and stimulate the latent vampire that's in there or the dormant vampire that's been residing in Jonathan Harker so he goes for it and it's ah! and he realizes no I can't, I can't, I can't do this so he demands, he's noticed that there's been a hammer and a stake on the table as well so he begs her to do it, but she can't do it. In the meantime, Dracula and his squadron of bats is laying assault to the, uh, the, the nunnery. In a really bravura sequence. And that's when he will reveal himself as the wolf padding up outside the gates. And then he will, because he gets taunted by Sister Abigail Van Helsing, who openly mocks him, takes the piss, slices a hand open, and chucks blood at him. You know, go on dog, laugh bad up, go on. You know, that's all you're going to get tonight. Just the scraps. <laughs> really taking a piss. But he gives as good as he, as he gets. He's just standing there full frontal nude in front of all these nuns. <laughs> one of you will give in to temptation. One of you will invite me in. Which one's the weakest out of you? None of them invite him in. It ends up being bloody Jonathan Harker, doesn't it? Harker tries to kill himself. He rams a stake into his heart. <laughs> Dracula will scale the wall and he'll find Harker's body there on the deck. But he opens the window. Jonathan, Johnny Blue Eyes. His eyes open. Yeah, the stake through the heart does kill you. But it's got to be someone else who puts it there. Now, I can do that for you and end all your suffering. All you got to do is invite me in. <laughs> so obviously he does. And cue the great massacre of the, uh, the nuns, which is great. It, 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 it's gory as well. Like so, you know, gore hounds. You're gonna get. You're gonna get some stuff to play around here, and it, it's lovely. It, the Beeb has done this and gone quite extreme. Um, the effects are great. As I say, you've got some. I would say CG embellishment for the uh, the forest and the uh, the mountaintop castle, Castle Dracula. I'm pretty certain you. This embed but it could, that, that, I'm also pretty saying that's a real castle as well. It looks a bit like Blofeld's hideaway in there on, on, Her Majesty, on Her Majesty's Secret Service. But, you know. Um, you've got, when he, he finds all these crates of air, and inside all these crates of air are the remains of other vampires who will wake up 
and they're a bit more disheveled, they're more zombie like. And they, they, they come, one of them comes out of its box, a small box, it's been crunched up inside, and it will come out. And it, the, way, the way that they've done the effect is really good, and they filmed it in a very strange way as well. Sort of like, not quite frame jumping, but it's kind of under cranked, and you know, and it's, you know, the way he moves. <laughs> Later on, on a rooftop parapet, Dracula takes, well, he, he's already saved uh, Jonathan Harker from the clutches of all these zombie minions. But then, you know, things will transpire and he's put the bite on him again. One of his brides has actually sealed Jonathan Harker in a box because she wants him all for herself because she's fucking starving. Because, like, you know, when Sister Abigail cuts her hand open and just scatters blood drops in Dracula's way, you know, take the scraps. He's been feeding all his minions just the scraps, you know. So she demands, you know, she puts him in the box, Jonathan Harker, because she's going to feed on him. But Dracula rescues him, only to, you know, threaten him again. And he throws him, you know, into the sunlight on his parapet. And he want, and in a very touching moment, he said, like, I've heard songs, I've read books, I've I've heard about this, I remember it, but I want you to describe the lover in the sky because I haven't seen her for so many centuries. And he wants Harker to describe the colour of the sun coming up over the mountains at dawn, and uh, but Harker will fucking do it, like. And he says, look, you know, are you going to kill me? Yes, I'm going to kill you. Don't kill me. Please don't kill me. And what? Could you possibly offer me in return for sparing you? And he says, like, you know, I'll, I'll do anything you want. I'll, I'll protect you. I'll do, I'll do anything you want. Okay. So when I go to England, um, and you know I'm going there, and this is the point. This is the point I'm getting to, like, where they explain why he's going there. And it's quite simple and overt. He said, I'm going there to slaughter hundreds and hundreds of people because there's more people there than there is here, and because he gets more. He has the ability to get more than just blood and nourishment from his victims. He gets, he absorbs their, you know, some intellect, some talent. You know, he, he gets more than just, you know, the bloody sustenance. So he said, like, you know, I'm going to kill all your loved ones and you're going to watch me do it. Is that what you want me to do? Is that, you won't stand in my way? And of course, Hark is not, you know, he ain't going to let you, ain't going to let that happen. So he, go, he goes, no. Once we get there, I'll do everything in my power to stop you. Oh, yeah. Dracula, yeah, yeah, I thought as much. Here we go again. And fucking snaps his neck. But of course, Harker's already been vampirized. Although he's not quite a vampire yet, but he's not, he's, all, he's also undead. So he comes to, and Dracula's like, you know, oh, you've come around pretty quickly. Normally it takes a while. And people, you know, once they've put the bite on and they, they make the turn, they're going to lie down for a bit. You can see where this sense of humour is creeping in, can't you? Well, I say creeping in, it's fucking overt. It's massively in your face. Dracula is just taking the piss. Um, but then again, this variation can do. He's an arrogant swine. You know, he knows he's got all the cards. He's holding all the, you know, he's got all the power. So, why wouldn't he be like that? He's having fun. He's enjoying himself. And, and that, you, you definitely get that sense, that gleeful sadism, which... Christopher Lee put it into various Dracula movies. He had that bestial sense of, um, you know, savage glee of what he could do at his own powers. Uh, and this guy, Klaus, something or other, oh God, uh, he does an extraordinarily good job of being charismatic, funny, erudite, and uh, a patronising twat as well. <laughs> and yet you do, you do like his character. Who'd have thought, you know? Uh, but Harker will not give in. And he's like, yeah, he's like, you know, you've turned really quickly. You know, you're a bit more like me. Now, how has that happened? What have you got inside you that's, you know, that's not the same as all these other fucking... Maybe it's because they're bloody English, you know? And uh, anyway, Harker gets up on the fucking rampart. Fucking throws himself in over the edge. And that's how he's got swept along. And apparently he's been swept out to sea in the, from the river and uh, fishermen haul him in. You don't see this, you just get told us by the air, uh, the nuns. And um, But he's a drowned man and yet that's how he ends up in the nunnery because, you know, how, how was it a drowned man was able to get up and walk around? And that's when you realise, oh shit, 
yeah, you're dead, aren't you? But this whole thing about the crucifix, they've tantalizingly teased about, like, look, you know, he goes, yeah, I don't like the cross, but it's not because of faith. It's not for the reasons you think. So this is now, you kind of sucked into this, you know, um, uh, Sister Abigail Van Helsing wants to find out the reasons why all these mythical things are so important, why they do matter, why they actually genuinely have an effect upon him, or vampires in general, but why does it? Why does a cross affect him? It's sort of semi-restored her faith in God, but it's got nothing to do with God. He's making it quite abundantly clear it's got nothing to do with God or faith, as far as he's concerned. And he's almost mocking me, <laughs> you'll, you'll never guess the reason why. Oh God, you know. But it's, it's clever. I I've, I really enjoyed it. And at 90 minutes, God, you're really getting it. They're really indulging us, you know. You know, how many... The Mandalorian's on for 30 fucking five minutes. Uh, most shows run for like 45, maybe 50 minutes. An hour-long show never is quite an hour long. It's always a few minutes shy of that. But this... Okay, it's a mini-series. It's only three episodes. But look at that. So that's going to be an hour and a half, an hour and a half, an hour and a half. What's that? That's... I don't know, that's three hours. It's four and a half hours. <laughs> that's quite epic vampire storytelling. So, and production values are great. Music's great. The effects are good. You've got gore. You've got, well, there's been no sex yet, but in a, I think it's kind of implied. There is a tricky line near the start, actually, when Sister Abigail first starts interrogating. Or, well, not interrogating. She's just trying to find out what happened. And they, you know, they are, they are looking after him as well, Jonathan Arker. She says, "Did, did you have sexual intercourse with the count?" <laughs> and you're like, and obviously Mina's is sitting next to her, but you don't know that at the time. And this this other sister just goes, "Ah," <laughs> and you're like, I was thinking, "Oh, where are we going with this?" Like, I know, you know, Mark Gattis uh, is a gay man, and he does put that sort of. Um, vibe into a lot of his uh, creativity, a lot of his stories, a lot of his scripts have gay elements to them. Fine. But I thought at the time, I thought, oh no, no, don't do that with, with this. But the point, the reason why she's asking that is she wants to work out how the infection is spread, what, it, what do vampires actually do? Is it the drinking of the blood? Is it, do they do something else? Is it a sexually transmitted disease? that make, creates another victim. You know, what is it? How is it transmitted? So it, that's that's her reason for asking. And, uh, and no, the Count has not. Bumped uglies with Jonathan Harker. <laughs> but, folks, I really enjoyed it. And so I'm going to review, like, tomorrow tomorrow's episode and then the final one and give a full resume about the whole thing. But... I do urge you to watch it. If you haven't done so already, please watch The Beeb's brand new 2020, well, it's made last year, but it's released today, 2020 version of Dracula. And uh, I think you'll be surprised. I think you'll enjoy it. But I've warned you now, it's not Hammer. It is not Francis Ford Coppola. It is not Nosferatu. You know, this, it, it's kind of like, uh, oh, let's think about this now. There's a hint of <laughs> love at first bite with its kind of satirical, comical bent with its dialogue. Uh, and crossed with, what else would it be crossed with? I don't know, really. Uh, League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, perhaps. Because it's got this, this quirky, blackly comic slant to it. And yet, the scary bits are genuinely scary. My daughter watched there, uh, my 12 year old daughter, Kilt Daughter. Uh, was watching it as well and uh, she jumped out of her skin in the first 15 minutes about three times and, uh, and I looked around and I thought <laughs> it's, it's got to you already hasn't it I mean I know the bits she jumped at and they were kind of mechanical uh, you know just you know, pure stingers but there was a pervading sense of ooh, spooky ookiness and that's what you need for the the segments in any version of Dracula in Castle Dracula You've got to really ramp up that sense of doom, gloom and foreboding. An eerie, dark mystery. You've got to have that there. That's the real secret essence <coughs> Excuse me, 
of why Dracula works. It's, they're always the best bits. You know, okay, you've got the chases and you've got the attacks back in England, blah, 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 blah. You know, there's loads of good stuff there later on. But that opening segment, that first act is still the most powerful. Anyway, folks, gonna leave it there. So, in the meantime, in between time, welcome 2020. And I wish you all health, prosperity, happiness. Uh, hope you all have fun this year. Now please watch Dracula and comment below what you thought. I know a few of you have watched it because people were messaging me while it was on. And uh, so yeah, I know. <laughs> people, some people were expressing. They would go, what the fuck? <laughs> but if you stuck with it, I think you'll see what they're doing. And they're going in a different direction. Broadly sticking to the, the, the plot narrative of your. But, you know, they're taking their own little deviations. Anyway. I'm going to see you all <laughs> later. The blood is the life. <laughs>